I think that the music today would be a, a curiosity. David Bowie originally was going to write the music for the film. I have no idea why the John Phillips soundtrack was never, was never released at all. It was very enjoyable and, and much fun. David enjoyed it very much. He believed that Bowie didn't actually want to do the music. He just couldn't do it. He couldn't get it together. Some of it would have fitted very well to the picture, in my view. No one has really sort of thought about the music that actually did end up in the film. We'd have had to pay so many royalties and so many fees that it would never have been practical. They were waiting for music, and they were waiting for music, and they were waiting for music, and nothing arrived. Whether it was because he was confused by who he was between the character and his own self or something else, I do not know. Well, I first met him, met him in 69, um, where I was uh, invited to... I'd been doing some arranging for about eight months before that, started at the end of 68 and kind of fell into arranging by just by, by chance meetings. I was not intending to be an arranger in the first place or a composer, but that's what turned out. And uh, I had been doing some arranging with some minor hits in the UK, and I was invited to uh, Gus Dudgeon's office, whom I had worked with on quite a few of those recordings, the producer, and um, the man who had just shortly before that become my, my erstwhile manager in London, Tony Hall. He was present at this uh, meeting at Gus's office. And there was this young man, David Bowie, to whom I was introduced. And they asked me to listen to the demo of Space Oddity, which I did, and asked me to be the arranger, which I was. And though we did that recording, and that became my, my first hit outside the UK, I got a call from Tony Hall's office um, and, uh, and they put me in touch with Nick Roig, who asked me, he said, David has asked you to be the co-composer on this film. We watched the movie together, and uh, I had no idea of what I was going to see. I didn't see it until I was at Bowie's house that he was renting. And uh, so we watched it, and we uh, started writing together. We composed at the piano at his Rhodes Fender, and uh, basically that was it. And we had this string machine, string synthesizer, which was the uh, the only machine of its type at the time that I can think of. We, we also, I think, we had an ARP Odyssey, which was a small synthesizer keyboard, like two and a half octaves or something like that. I had bought these wonderful mbiras, okay, um, which is the African name for thumb piano. I can't describe the sound of it. It's a bell-like tone, very beautiful. And I laid, and I had brought them with me from England. I bought three of them, the only three they had in the store. I bought them, I just walked in and swiped them off, got them. He wrote a song which I thought was very beautiful, actually called Wheels which actually refers to the train that he's seen riding on his home planet, an odd-looking transportation device. It supported the idea of his family and that he was missing them terribly, obviously, and, uh, and it accompanied the footage of the train in the, this kind of desert type of landscape. So there's this moving moment where this the song would have fitted very well. And um, then there was another instrumental that he's very much responsible for that I played on along with Jay Peter. We added synthesizers. It's on the album Low. And I didn't know that it had been included in the album. So in fact, that's the only remnant of music from The Man Who Fell to Earth sessions that survived. And, um, you know, apparently the they were waiting for music and they were waiting for music and they were waiting for music and nothing arrived and I guess everybody started getting a little jittery. Whether he was confused by the conflict between himself as David Bowie as he seemed on the screen and the alien and what he looked like and whether that 
almost split, in, split um, personality was too difficult to cope with on I do not know, but he couldn't do it. It was unfinished, simply, quite simply unfinished. There had yet to be orchestrations to be done. I wish I was going to do, and I was going to transcribe some of this stuff and expand it for orchestral cues. And it never got to that stage. So um, I'm not quite sure why that turned out that way. Um, but that's the way it turned out. And Nick um, heard what we'd done and rejected it. It was not complete. Nick came up with an alternative idea. Um, and that was John Phillips, who he knew. He was a very clever musician. He has also had been part of the Mums and the Puppets, which was a successful band. He met John Phillips in, in uh, L.A. Um, they met at Candy Clark's house, and, and he brought a small portable TV and played John the film, um, which was an edit that didn't have any music in it at all. Nick Rogue had given him a pretty specific brief, which was that he wanted a, a, a soundtrack that sort of explored different aspects of Americana, so sort of folk, jazz, blues, bluegrass, uh, you know, rock music, different types of American music, basically. And um, I think that my understanding was that was sort of a little different from what Bowie had been working on, which was more, had, you know, used synths and was more, I guess, partly what you would expect of a sci-fi movie. And, and Nick wanted to go into a completely different direction. Um, and John Phillips was a very good choice for that because he was very well versed in a lot of different types of music. He went to England in January 1975, started the sessions pretty soon afterwards, and obviously did a little bit of prep work. Um, the sessions ran through February 75, and the film premiered in March, mid March. So it was, I mean, it, you know, you can see how much of a, a kind of a rush job and, and the kind of, um, you know, very sort of tight deadline he was under. So, um, I, I think he really just had to sort of, you know, get his thoughts together pretty quickly and, and, and you know, basically do a lot of this stuff on, on the fly. That's, that's my understanding of it. The sessions for the, for the soundtrack were sort of done at a place called CTS in, in Wembley in London. And um, it was a custom-built, it was the first custom-built multi-room studio in the UK and it had been built over a boating lake. And he used a pretty sort of tight, small group of musicians um, and some sort of very well-known kind of session players in sort of the rock world. There was a guy called Henry Spinetti on drums, a um, bass player called Herbie Flowers who was, uh, had worked with David Bowie and was the bass player for T-Rex. Um, there was a guy called B.J. Cole who played steel guitar. Um, they also had a keyboard player, a percussionist, um, synthesizer. Um, that's about it. And, 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 and also guitarists. There was um, Big Jim Sullivan, who was a, another very well-known session player in London who worked with Joe Meek. And um, chiefly, the, you know, the, the main uh, person that John had wanted to work with was Mick Taylor, who had sort of left the Rolling Stones maybe about a year earlier. And, and uh, Mick Taylor basically was sort of leading the band that, that uh, you know, John was working with. Now there was a song called Liar Liar that he recorded for the film and it was um, um, kind of recorded specifically for the film. Um, and it, uh, uh, it's, it's runs, if, if you didn't, if you weren't listening for it, you would probably miss it completely. It sort of runs in the background. It's in the, it's in the scene where Bernie Casey uh, is talking to Rip Torn in, in Bernie Casey's house and uh, it's sort of towards the end of the film. And it's sort of playing on a radio somewhere, and it's 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 a it's a great song. It's like a, it's it's the kind of thing that you would never associate with with John Phillips in a million years, or even the Mamas and the Papas, because it's a reggae tune, and uh, it sort of seems to have been kind of quite heavily influenced by Jimmy Cliff's "The Harder They Come" or um, Desmond Decker's "Shanty Town," which is also on the "Harder They Come" soundtrack. And um, John was a big reggae fan, and. Uh, so, you know, you have this song, it's, uh, it's got this sort of like great sort of backbeat going on, but played by Henry Sp uh, Spinetti and, uh, uh, you know, this kind of fantastic bass line by Herbie Flowers and 
It's just one of the highlights of the, the soundtrack. People need reassuring. They got a right to the facts. I understand, Mr. Peters. Well, I'm not quite sure you understand how all this might affect you. Pretty much all of the music John Phillips recorded for The Man Who Fell to Earth was original. Um, he did record uh, a cover version of Hello, Mary Lou, which was a sort of Ricky Nelson hit. Um, and um, because of the time constraints on him, um, he used a, a number of pieces that he'd written previously. Um, one of those was a, a track called Devil on the Loose that he'd recorded in 1972 um, with the Jazz Crusaders as his backing band. And he sort of radically reworked that for The Man Who Fell to Earth. And it sort of was a very sort of sleazy, streetwise jazz funk tune, very reminiscent of Miles Davis's 70s music. Um, and it had a sort of a, a vocoder dueling with a saxophone on it. And, and you can hear it on the, um, when Bryce, the foot, it, it sort of introduces Bryce, the character of Bryce Ripton's character and sort of, you know, pretty well sums up his character as this sort of lascivious college professor. When you hear certain types of music or certain songs, they have certain associations, whether they're cultural associations or personal associations. So, you know, say if you hear a hit song that was sort of like an Elvis Presley song, or, or actually in the case of the movie, like you have uh, Roy Orbison's music, you have Fats Domino, it sort of calls up certain associations in your head, and especially if you were there at the time um, and, you know, you would remember what you were doing at any particular point when you first heard that song. Um, but these are things that when you hear them at another time, that, you know, um, basically that's a world that doesn't exist anymore. Those kind of associations don't exist anymore. They only exist in memory. Um, and uh, Paul Mailsberg had sort of suggested that that was part of the idea of using a lot of this old, older sort of American music, um, you know, jazz and blues and, and, and folk tunes, was... Um, Really, the, the concept was that music is a time travel device. It takes you to a place in time within yourself or, you know, a different head, headspace. Or in, in, and, and in some senses, that sort of suddenly connects back with the idea of a sci-fi movie, the idea of time travel or space travel. Um, so I think that was, that was the idea behind using American, Americana rather than something that was more obvious for, you know, a sci-fi soundtrack. Um, and... John Phillips, when he was working on his score, really sort of keyed into that idea. So a lot of the music cues that he was doing were um, exploring all these different facets of American music. There's some sort of very traditional sounding jazz. Um, there's kind of like a, a bluegrass. There are sort of blues tunes, folk music. Um, and then at the same time, he did quite abstract pieces as well. Um, there's a sort of a very... Um, strange kind of ethereal blues that he sounds, almost sounds improvised that that um, plays over the the scene towards the end of the movie where where Bryce and Thomas Newton meet out in the desert. Um, there's also a version of America the Beautiful that's sort of a very kind of abstract, almost like Jimi Hendrix's version of the sort of national anthem. Um, so he sort of really played around with these things, sort of did very abstract. Uh, pieces of music and, and sort of quite conventional pieces of music at the same time. Unusually, he was given the, the credit as a musical director rather than um, composer of the score or original soundtrack or anything like that. And, and I think um, he also, as far as I know, he had some hand in compiling the, the sort of existing catalogue music that was used in the film that was also very big part of the film. There was an awful lot of catalog, um, sort of existing music that was that was used, and a lot of that music sort of really keys into that same idea of nostalgia. You know, kind of evoking a, a time and a place and a feeling, um, which sort of, you know, when you think about the movie, you have Thomas Newton, and 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 he has this, you know, kind of aching sort of 
nostalgia for, for the planet that he left behind and the family he left behind. So a lot of the music, you know, is keyed into that, that particular idea of nostalgia. I have no idea why the John Phillips soundtrack was never, was never released at all. People have asked me why we didn't release a soundtrack album of The Man Who Fell to Earth, which would have been very, very interesting indeed. But it was complicated because the music belonged to so many different people. We'd have had to pay so many royalties and so many fees that it would never have been practical, so we didn't. There's a, there's a strange thing, there's one reference to the, to the film soundtrack. It, 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 there's a, there's a novelization, or, or the, the original book was re-released um, to, co to coincide with the release of the film. And um, on the front of the, of the paperback it says, or the back of the paperback it says, um, you know, the RCA soundtrack from Man Who Fell to Earth now available. So that's the only reference there is to an actual soundtrack, which has sort of driven kind of Bowie fans and sort of soundtrack collectors crazy for years. I think they're all wondering where, where on earth this thing went. But, I, I, you know, as far as I know, there was no... You know, John never worked on compiling the soundtrack himself. I think that the music today would be a, a curiosity, a curiosity value. Uh, I had some cassettes of monitor mixes, rough mixes made at the time, and I have no idea where they are. They're in storage somewhere. <laughs>